from the Gospel of Matthew is fairly popular for this time of year. So the details are probably familiar to you. Jesus stands trial before the governor, Pontius Pilate. The crowd gathers to raise accusations against him. Pilate isn't convinced that Jesus is guilty, but since the crowd wants to punish someone, he makes them an offer. He remembers the festival tradition of releasing one prisoner back into society. And Pilate gives them this choice. Would they rather have Jesus released, Jesus who has done nothing wrong, or did they want a different Jesus, the notorious criminal named Jesus Barabbas? Now the Jewish chief priests and the elders aren't having it. They brought Jesus here, and they want to see him punished. So they whip the crowd into a frenzy, and soon the people are chanting. They're shouting for the release of Barabbas, a criminal. And they're demanding that Jesus be killed. So despite his innocence, they want Jesus crucified. They want him executed on a cross. These details are familiar to us during the season of Lent, but there's one sentence in this account that often gets overlooked. And I know I've read this many times over the years, but I didn't notice this until Pastor Joel and I decided our Lenten series would be on the topic of the seven deadly sins. So tonight I want to draw attention to this one easy-to-miss detail. So we have the chief priests and the elders, and they arrest Jesus. They bring him before the governor, but Pilate finds Jesus not guilty. And that's when he decides to offer them this choice between releasing Jesus or releasing Barabbas. And Pilate does this, the Bible says, because he realized it was out of jealousy that they handed Jesus over. Jealousy. It was out of jealousy that the Jewish priests and elders handed Jesus over to be crucified. A more formal term for this is envy. They were envious of him. And this is surprising. Their envy is interesting here because even though Jesus encounters these priests and elders many times over the course of his ministry, Even though they give him a hard time, we usually don't think it's because they're jealous. Usually when you hear about the Jewish officials confronting Jesus, the Bible will show them critiquing him. You know, they don't like what he does, or they don't like what he teaches. So usually it's, it seems like these men thought that they knew better than Jesus. You know, the priests and the elders would show up wherever Jesus was, and they'd pick apart his teachings. And we get a sense that they do this because they're afraid he'll lead people astray, that Jesus is teaching something they're not. You know, usually we think that they're trying to protect the Jewish faith, but tonight's lesson doesn't follow from that pattern. Here, before Pontius Pilate, we find out what's really been bothering them about Jesus. We find out that the chief priests and the elders are jealous of him. They're envious of Jesus. But why do they envy him? Was it because he had more followers than they did at the Jewish temple? Probably not, because the biggest crowd we ever see for Jesus is about 5,000 people, but nowhere does it say that those people stop being Jewish. No, they call Jesus rabbi. They recognize him as a Jewish teacher, and he was, you know. Jesus wasn't stealing anyone from the temple. He taught the same thing that the priests and the elders did. This was their message. This was Jesus' message. It was, God wants you to lovingly follow his commandments, 
oh, you can't? Well, that's because you sin. Um, and sin is the opposite of following the commandments. And that sin leads to death. But someday, God will send his Savior to destroy the threats of sin and death. So what Jesus taught, his content, was no different than that of the Jewish priests and elders. So what did they envy? Well, when we read God's word, we see that Jesus did something that they couldn't. He lived and taught in a way that showed God's promised Savior had actually arrived. These priests and elders didn't believe that. More to the point, they refused to believe that Jesus was this promised Savior. That Jesus was the one God had sent to save sinners. And because they refused to believe, they were filled with this sin of envy because they knew Jesus taught with an authority that they couldn't. They knew Jesus had some understanding of God's word around which they couldn't wrap their heads. So I can see why the Jewish priests and elders were envious. I mean, just imagine doing your job every single day, and you are the most loyal employee. But then this new guy shows up who seems to know the job better than you ever could. That's what's going on here. The chief priests and the elders taught God's word, the words that had been passed down to them since God himself had spoken to Moses and the prophets. And suddenly Jesus shows up and he talks like God. He speaks like he is the word of God, like he is God talking to his people again. So I can understand why the Jewish officials were envious. Now, it doesn't make them right. I mean, it doesn't make their envy not a sin. But I can see where they're coming from. Now, if we really do our homework, we find that envy is probably one of the oldest of sins. Because God created Adam and Eve. He created first man and woman. He placed them in a garden paradise, and he gave them only one rule. He said, you may freely eat of every tree in this garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, dying you shall die. Seems like a nice setup. I mean, you have a beautiful home, only one rule. But where there are rules, there is also temptation to break those rules. So we see a serpent, understood to be the devil, approaches Eve. And he asks her, Did I hear God say, You shall not eat from any tree in this garden? And Eve says, Well, no, we can eat from any tree except for that one over there in the middle. That one will kill us. The serpent says to her, well, I don't think so. You won't die. God knows that when you eat of it, you will become like God. You will know good and evil. Then Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They didn't eat it because they were hungry. No, there were other trees in the garden for that. But they ate that fruit because the devil had reminded him that it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate the fruit because they realized God knew something they didn't. That he had some sort of special knowledge of good and evil. They wanted that knowledge. They were jealous that God had it, and they didn't. And so they envied God. And that envy led to death. So this is why in the Middle Ages, envy was grouped among the seven deadly sins. Like our proverb from tonight says, 
A content heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. So envy, like all sin, leads to death. And envy is more than just feeling sad that somebody has something you don't. No, it's that jealous obsession you get when you want what isn't yours. We envy others for their wealth and their success. We burn with jealousy over how many friends they have or how loving their family is. We envy how put together their lives seem. You know, we tickle with annoyance whenever they post another perfect selfie or whenever we open their gorgeous Christmas card and they seem to have the perfect life. But envy is most deadly in this. When we're jealous of the things that are God's alone, the things that he never intended for us. Because Adam and Eve didn't need the knowledge of good and evil. They were given a perfect paradise in which to live. Death wasn't even a possibility for them, and yet they envied that knowledge that only God had, even at the cost of their own lives. In the same way, the Jewish priests and elders didn't need to discover the secret of Jesus' teaching. No, he was freely sharing it with anybody who would actually listen. All they had to do was hear him out. If they had listened, they would have known in an instant that this really was God talking to them. Jesus Christ, the Word of God, was speaking to them directly in the same way that God had talked to Moses and the prophets. Yet they envied that knowledge that only Jesus had, even at the cost of his life. Well, this is for us as well, because we envy. And it's not just that we are jealous of people in our lives. We are often jealous of God. We want to know all he knows, instead of just being content with what he would share with us. Like Adam and Eve, like Jesus preaching to the Jewish people, God has given us all we need for this life by his word. Yet we envy that which we don't have, even at the cost of our lives. We waste hours and days and years of our life running after things we never can or never should have. God is God. Only He is all-powerful and all-knowing. In the first commandment, we're told that we're not supposed to create any other gods. And that includes us. We're not supposed to envy God's position or what he chooses not to reveal to us. Instead, we're supposed to gladly listen to what he has told us in his word. Jesus preached it. The priests and the elders preached it. Remember? God wants you to lovingly follow his commandments. Oh, you can't do that? Well, that's because we're all sinners. Okay, well, sin is the opposite of following those commandments, and unfortunately, sin leads to death. But one day, God sent his Savior to destroy the threats of sin and death. God became a man, the one and only Jesus Christ. And by our envy, like the jealousy of Adam and Eve, the chief priests and elders, by our envy, Jesus was sent to the cross, carrying your envy, bearing all your deadly sins. Jesus Christ staggered under the weight of that cross, 
And when he couldn't carry it anymore, they nailed his hands and feet to the wood, and they raised him up in mockery. And it was on that cross that Jesus died the most painful and the least enviable of deaths for you. The good news is that it doesn't end there. Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. God himself defeated the tempter. He defeated sin, and he defeated that death that comes from sin. Out of love, Jesus did all of this for you. So despite your deadly sins, he set out to bring you eternal life by his word. And how does he do that? Well, that's a message I think that's best saved for Easter. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.